Welcome to Edgecast, the series where we show you tips, tricks, and best practices when using Solid Edge. Now, in this episode, we'll be discussing synchronous mode from first principles. So, I'll start by explaining what the term means, how it works, why and when you should use it, and the three methods of controlling a synchronous model. Finally, we'll include a simple demo of what's achievable with synchronous mode in part and assembly environments. As you might be aware, Traditional CAD modeling involves creating features one after another, where any new features depend on other features that were created before them. Now this is how ordered mode in Solid Edge behaves, and is known as history-based modeling, as users create a timeline of events or features while they work. Any edits made earlier to this timeline of events may affect features created later on, and they'll need to be recalculated. Synchronous, though, translates roughly as occurring at the same time, and as the name suggests, all features in a synchronous model are calculated at the same time. What that means is that editing the first created feature does not necessarily change any later features. It does this by removing the dependency between features and their sketches, instead making 3D calculations which take into account all the faces present in the model. Now some users who've never used synchronous mode before are put off by the idea of no sketch dependency, as that's the way they've always controlled their geometry in the past. However, there are more ways to control geometry than simply editing sketches. Synchronous mode in Solid Edge uses a number of different technologies to edit part geometry. Any synchronous edit updates only the geometry identified by 3D dimensions, synchronous live rules governing faces, and any user-defined face relationships. And because of the localized nature of the edits, system performance is impressive. So why does this mode exist? Synchronous mode was designed to bridge the gap between traditional history-based CAD and what's known as explicit modeling. Explicit modeling is a method sometimes used by non-engineering software as a method of creating geometry very quickly, but with very little useful information in it. For example, there are no named features in explicit models, only a collection of faces. Edits cannot be driven by dimensions, and as a result, assigning formulae to automatically update geometry is not possible. On the other hand, history-based models are inflexible, require pre-planning of what needs to change in a design before the change is requested, and for complex parts may need a complete rework if an earlier feature can't be changed without breaking everything else. As a crossover between the two, synchronous models do obey dimensions and formulae, just like history-based models, but can also be created and edited in a similar way to explicit models, by moving around faces, not features. As a result, they can be used by design engineers to make rapid edits, but still retain useful information such as dimensions, which would be needed by anyone manufacturing their components. On the face of it, synchronous mode sounds like the best idea for all occasions, but there are certain scenarios where ordered mode, or history-based modeling, is advisable. For example, creating and editing a gear, linkage, or other machine part may be much faster in synchronous mode than ordered. However, if creating a product with many curved surfaces, it's best to do these in ordered mode, as sketch information may be needed to edit these features. Remember, synchronous parts do not have sketch dependency. You may also want to switch over to ordered mode if parts are being created around each other in an assembly, with direct file links created by tools such as the Interpart Copy. This information is listed as part history and cannot be used to provide live updates to synchronous geometry. In these scenarios, we advise using ordered mode instead. Now before this demonstration, here are the three tools that I'll be using. Synchronous live rules, 3D dimension features, and 3D face relationships. I'll start by creating a brand new part and transitioning to synchronous mode. I can do this by right-clicking in the graphics window and selecting the transition to synchronous option. My aim here is to generate a journal bearing bracket to cover an engine shaft. To start with, I'll add a square sketch to my part environment. Notice how I don't need to create a sketch button. The 2D and 3D tools are in the same environment in Synchronous. 
instead of having to select a plane, I can use the F3 lock to plane command to restrict my sketching. I'll then place and dimension my sketch lines as I would in an ordered model, but I won't trim any lines back. This is because I'm not going to work with the sketch lines themselves, but the areas bounded by the lines to create my geometry. Now I'm finished sketching, I can select my regions, or any areas bounded by lines, to create an extrude. Also notice that I don't need to start an extrusion. It's implied by me selecting the regions that I want to add or move material. To start an extrude, I'll select the straight double-headed arrow and move my mouse in the direction I want to add material. Now that I've made my first geometry for this bracket, I want to start adding a plate to bolt onto a bulkhead. I'll select my previously unused regions and extrude again with this directional arrow. This arrow is otherwise known as the steering wheel and is a fundamental component of synchronous mode. You may notice that extruding geometry creates a dimension in 3D space, which I can then edit to change the geometry. You may also notice that all sketch lines that were entirely used to generate geometry are moved into the used sketches container in the feature tree. If we want to, we can reuse them, but there are means to an end in synchronous and cannot drive geometry. Next, I'm going to add some rounds to the part. First, some large outside rounds. Then two on either side of the bearing cylinder. And finally some smaller rounds to remove sharp edges from the faces exposed after fitting. In reality more rounds would be needed, but for the purposes of this demonstration I'll skip them. After the rounds are added, I'll place some threaded holes on this part. Now the best practice when placing synchronous holes is to lock onto a plane with F3. This means that all holes placed while locked will be normal for this plane. It's also possible to lock onto key points when placing holes. The centre points of these four arcs will make excellent mounting hole locations. To make the centre points available for selection, I first need to hover my mouse briefly over the edge of the rounds, then snap to the highlighted centre point in the middle. It may also be useful to orient the view to the locked plane with Ctrl H, as this simplifies the part display and makes mistakes less likely. Uh, speaking of mistakes, it seems I've only threaded the first 2mm of the hole. Let's correct that. By selecting the hole, then the procedural feature edit handle I can change the hole's parameters. Procedural features are special synchronous features that contain information about how they were created, and there are exceptions to the rule that synchronous faces have no knowledge of how they were made. Also note that holes created at the same time share attributes. Changing one changes all the others. For my next step, I'm going to make some simple holes on the top of the bracket. First I'll need to select the hole type, and clear my plane lock with F3. Locking onto a plane, I'll add these two holes. They're out of alignment, but that's something I can correct later. 
Now I'm going to mirror these holes across the ZY plane. Synchronous mirrors do update, unless told otherwise, as we'll see when we align the first set of holes. Now that I've got all my required features in place, I'll start moving them around with synchronous commands. The main method of editing a synchronous model is with the steering wheel. By clicking on a face, I can move it around. Dragging the steering wheel to an edge would allow me to rotate this face as well. But note how the attached faces move with the first one I selected. In addition, the holes moved with the rounded edges, as Solid Edge has identified that these are concentric to the moving faces. And the geometry on either side of the part changes, as it has been identified as symmetric. All of this behaviour is indicated in the small Design Intent panel that you can see to the side. The second method of editing geometry is to place and edit 3D dimensions attached to the model. In this case, I want to change the width of the part to 100mm and prevent any further steering wheel edits. I can do that by locking the dimension. Now any changes to this parameter must be achieved by editing the dimension only. I'll also change the overall part length to 60, first changing the direction of the face move so that only the furthest face moves. When using the steering wheel to move a face locked by a dimension, the dimension will pull other faces with it, as you can see here. Now before moving these holes around, I'm going to toggle to counterboard holes. Bear in mind that the counterbore is taken from the side on which the holes were originally placed. This is more to make them easier to select, uh, in this case. Note that when attempting to move, move this hole to the right, a warning appears. This is because I still have concentric design intent active and a locked dimension governing part width. Therefore my action here would introduce conflicting information in this part. So how do we move these holes? We can do so by using the design intent panel and disabling the concentric live rule during the hole moves. Now the move works, and by keeping symmetric live rules active, the holes on the other side of the ZY plane move by the same amount. If I toggle this off, only the two holes on this side of the part move, as they are linked by the Aligned Holes Live rule. And toggling this off, finally, means that only this one selected hole moves. Next, the dimensions attached to this 3D model can be linked with formulae. I want to introduce an automatic update in the part, so that whenever the bearing inner diameter changes, the bearing's external diameter is always twice this value. To do this, we need to lock both dimensions, as a formula can't be driven by an unlocked dimension. Next, I need to dimension the outer diameter. I'll toggle my dimension type over to diameter, not radius. Next, if I right-click the diameter I just placed and select Edit Formula, the Formula command bar appears. In a similar way to creating an Excel formula, I can type equals times two, then in the 3D window, select the dimension I want to drive this formula. I've also added a comment, in case I forget why this formula was written. Now, whenever the bearing shaft size changes, the outer diameter changes with it. And finally, I'm going to introduce the third method of manipulating a synchronous model user-defined face relationships. The holes I just placed earlier are out of alignment and need to be fixed. It is possible to achieve this with dimensions, but these take up valuable screen space. Instead, I'm going to use this Relationships panel. I'm going to use this Aligned Holes command to, well, as you might have guessed, align the holes. Firstly, I'll select the stationary hole, then all the holes to align to this hole, and finally, a vector along which the holes will line up. In this case, I'm going to use the side of the part. 
Now, when I perform a move on just one of these holes, even with the aligned holes live rule turned off, these holes keep their alignment, as do their mirrored counterparts. All these part relationships that we can create are stored at the bottom of the synchronous feature tree, just here, where they can be edited or deleted. Finally, I'll turn off all 3D dimensions so that the part can be viewed more easily by unchecking the PMI box in the feature tree. Now we're going to save this part and move into the assembly environment. In this engine assembly, I'm going to import and constrain the bearing we just created fairly quickly. Nothing too fancy needed here. But I will need to add an offset between the bearing and the engine itself. Once it's in place, by default you can only select an entire part in the assembly. However, if you toggle selection mode to face priority and not part priority, you then become able to select individual part faces at assembly level. Here's our steering wheel back again, all the 3D dimensions affecting the face selected, and the live rules box. I tend to use the control and spacebar keyboard shortcut to toggle face selection rather than selecting it from the select tool menu but that's entirely down to personal preference. It's possible to move faces to key points in other parts at the assembly level. This doesn't introduce any automatic linking between these faces, but it is a rapid method of editing parts at assembly level. We can also carry out all edits on existing geometry that we might expect in the part environment. The only limitations are that part features can only be created with assembly features, and any simple assembly dimensions we place won't drive the part. If you're interested in learning the full capabilities of synchronous mode in Solid Edge, we do run a one-day training course on the subject, where we cover best practices, design intent, editing CAD neutral geometry, and other topics. For more details, I advise contacting your sales account manager. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, topics you'd like us to cover, or any other feedback, please let us know by emailing us at support at cuttingedge.co.uk and be sure to tune in to watch the next episode of Edgecast.